Imran, how are you doing? Maybe you'll introduce yourself quickly for our audience. Very well. Uh, Imran Khan is my name, and uh, I'm a professor at the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, University of California, Davis. And um, uh, I work on infectious diseases. It's really, really great to, to have you here, and thank you so much for your time today. Um, you're an infectious disease specialist. We'd like to ask you um, a number of questions about your research, but let's get started by just asking you, do you think that emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases are the biggest danger to humanity at the moment? There's certainly a big risk. Uh, many years ago, it was thought that uh, up until the 80s, that infectious diseases have been conquered. For viruses, we had, uh, and we still do, um, vaccines, and uh, we have uh, antibiotics for bacteria. But uh, HIV came along and it broke that myth. And immediately it was a big, huge public health issue. And it was a pandemic, and uh, it still is in many ways. Uh, but that made everybody realize that uh, emerging infectious diseases are going to be a problem. Uh, so th this is um, the reason uh, why I think there will be emerging uh, other emerging infectious diseases sort of worse than COVID, perhaps. Uh, we've had Ebola, SARS, MERS, Zika, Dengue, West Nile, and a number of others. But uh, the thing is that uh, imagine if there was a COVID-19 like another virus that we couldn't make vaccine against and it would be a huge problem. And there are uh, indications uh, in history, for example, um, Indus Valley civilization was a big civilization, north, south, in the modern day Pakistan and uh, west toward uh, Middle East, very strong trade with Mesopotamia about three to 4,000 years ago with Egypt. But about 1,500 to 2,000 years ago, it just disappeared completely and nobody fully understand what the reason might be. Uh, but infectious disease is one of the uh, possible reasons why it got wiped out. There are two key drivers of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, poverty, and limitations to making vaccines. For poverty, rich countries need to be much more cooperative in alleviating it. For vaccines, we need to realize we got lucky with COVID-19. We may not get so lucky with the next big respiratory disease as, for example, for HIV and tuberculosis, we still don't have very effective vaccines. Lastly, international organizations like WHO need to be very realistic in their estimates. For example, for TB, TB roughly kills one and a half million people a year and has done so for decades. Yet WHO says that by 2035, it'll be eradicated. This is not only unrealistic, but outrageously dangerous. If, if there'd been no rapid development of a vaccine, for example, um, the next such infectious disease could potentially wipe out humanity. What would your thoughts be on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, we came, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> very close to that scenario. If we weren't able to make a vaccine, that probably would have been much worse than it looks now. But look, I mean, even that we had a vaccine and it prevented a lot of people from dying and infection and disease, uh, but the thing is that the after effects, the socioeconomic effects are still felt. Uh, you know, all that uh, monetary easing that was done all, or, all around the world has caused serious inflation. So it, things can, be, can go bad, compounded very quickly. And the infectious disease could be the big trigger. How did you get into this area? Like, what's your what's your background? Give us a bit of a potted history of how you became interested in infectious diseases. Yeah, I started with AIDS research uh, many years ago. Um, I was <clears throat> trying to understand how the virus causes disease and uh, worked in uh, 
animal models also. So HIV, human AIDS, monkeys, cats. Cats naturally get AIDS like virus. So I was also involved in making a vaccine. Uh, so that that's sort of the background. And then in the last uh, 12 years or so, I've been working very heavily in uh, tuberculosis. And uh, tuberculosis is another very problematic uh, disease. There are roughly 10 million new cases every year and one and a half million people die of tuberculosis. There is no vaccine. It is generally curable because some of the antibiotics that are specifically for the bug that causes TB are very effective. But the problem is diagnostics are not very good. So um, vaccine is generally the best protection against infectious diseases, but TB does not have a vaccine. And again, uh, looking back at HIV, after working on, uh, you know, people have been working on HIV vaccine for four decades now. And uh, there is no vaccine till today. Uh, malaria has the first vaccine that is being tried out in Cameroon now. And uh, we don't really know exactly how effective it is. So among the three big infectious diseases, TB is at the top killer, 1.5 million, HIV roughly a million, and uh, malaria about 400,000 a year worldwide. So um, they, they, none of these have a very effective vaccine as of today. So a major theme of your research is emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. Where do we stand these days in relation to infectious diseases and what would you say has changed over the last few years? Well re-emerging diseases are also a problem. I mean new emerging diseases are obviously a very difficult thing if there are no effective treatments, there are no vaccines, but re-emerging diseases are a problem too. <clears throat> drug resistance and tuberculosis. Uh, people who stop taking drugs because it's a long, uh, six month long uh, treatment, when they stop taking drugs because uh, uh, drugs can be toxic, when the uh, bacteria uh, come back, uh, then there is a big risk of uh, resistance, drug resistance. You can have drug resistant TB <clears throat> in about 30 to 35% of the cases where the disease recurs. Um, similarly, re-emergence of HIV is a big risk. Uh, I mean, USAID funded uh, a treatment of about 25 to 26 million uh, HIV patients in Sub-Saharan Africa. So with the uh, USAID uh, being shut down, uh, virus it does not die with the treatment, it's still in the body, but it's below the level that causes disease and it is not possible to transmit a person is under treatment. It won't transmit it to somebody else. But within three to four weeks of stopping the treatment, the virus comes back. So uh, AIDS is going to be a big re-emerging problem, problem. And that might take a while to uh, sort of take care of. We're living in very interesting times, that's for sure, with all of the changes at the moment with the US government. Um, I'd like to ask you a few things about your blood test for tuberculosis. Like you've developed a blood test for tuberculosis. How is the development of this blood test progressing? And if trials are successful, when would you anticipate that the test that you've developed for tuberculosis may be available? Yeah, um, the blood test for tuberculosis that I have is basically addresses the need uh, that till today, all the best, the greatest and the latest technologies that have been used for diagnostics are based on sputum as a specimen. Uh, sputum <clears throat> is what people cough up uh, because in about 70% of the cases, lungs are involved, but there are cases about 20, 25% <clears throat> where lung is not involved. So you don't get sputum as a specimen. So you have to use blood and uh, children do not produce sputum very well. So uh, there is limitation. So roughly about 25 to 30% of TB does not benefit from sputum based tests. So the blood test I have developed, <clears throat> it detects active tuberculosis, not just the infection, but people who have gotten the disease. And there are there is another blood test which does not discriminate between people who just have <clears throat> a quiet or a latent infection and active disease, but my test only detects the active disease. And we've run 
blinded trials over the last uh, couple of years in uh, India, and uh, the, the results have been very good. These, the, the results of these blinded trials have been now submitted as a report form to the Indian Council for Medical Research, and we're waiting to hear back whether we will get the approval. Uh, Professor Khan, you're at the forefront of infectious disease research. Let's imagine for a moment that you were stuck in an elevator. You had a few moments with some of the leaders of the different countries around the world. What advice would you give to alleviate the threat of emerging infectious diseases? Yeah, that's a good word you use, alleviate. So um, <laughs> it is certainly very important to alleviate poverty. With alleviation of poverty, you improve nutrition worldwide, you improve living conditions, improved hygienic conditions, and also the a lot of the new emerging zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic means the diseases that jump species from animals to humans. Uh, you know, uh, poor populations around the world are going into areas in wilderness and forests where people did not used to go. So animals that carry various viruses and bacteria who live there, human population has not been exposed to them. So our immune system has not evolved to fight those infections. And if it does fight, it does not fight it properly. It's not in a balanced way. So um, poverty alleviation is a big thing that improves public health in general, especially in poor countries, because the infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure is not very good. And um, a lot of times the emerging diseases originate in poor countries. So by improving poverty situation, the healthcare can be overall in general improved. And then, uh, you know, continue to use uh, latest technologies for making vaccines. For example, the mRNA vaccine, uh, mRNA, um, a, a messenger RNA vaccine for COVID-19 is a new technology. It has never been used as a vaccine before. So Professor Khan, you're also a published author. You wrote a novel called Gambit on the Devil's Chessboard, which is a political thriller. The novel discusses population increases in developing countries and how this can push people to migrate to remote and ecologically sensitive zones and may contain new pathogens. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write this novel? and how you drew on real events while you were writing this novel. You know, understanding that alleviation poverty is overall a very important issue for everybody, okay? And it's not just poor populations going into uninhabited areas, uh, but also poor populations uh, as pressure to migrate to advanced countries. And this is where a lot of the migrant pressure is coming on the advanced countries. And advanced countries need to understand this really well because uh, it's not only poverty, but also war zones. You know, a number of times there are advanced countries who are involved in armed conflicts in various parts of the world, creates serious problems and infectious diseases especially the emerging infectious diseases like HIV and TB in particular, is a big problem in refugee camps and in war zones. Uh, so so that, is a, that is a big issue. And uh, so I think uh, uh, it's an important area for everybody to realize. Uh, also in uh, developing countries, it's a big issue because the political institutions and economic institutions are not very well developed. Uh, last year's uh, Nobel Prize in economics went to those who explained this very well. Okay, And that leads to geopolitical and geoeconomic issues, but also global health issues. So these were the reasons why I wrote the book. And uh, it's entitled uh, Gambit on the Devil's Chessboard with uh, world being the devil's chessboard and how various powers and local corrupt leaders manipulate the political and economic situations for their own benefit and that leads to poverty and uh, so th th that was the idea to just not only highlight the problem but also to suggest solutions of what what can be done so it is done in a fiction format, in a novel format, and in a geopolitical thriller format. 
and yeah, it's available on Amazon. We certainly recommend everybody listening to this to go out and get a copy. It's a fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Khan. It's great to see you. Thank you for joining us on our interview series. Any final thoughts for our audience? Like any any final like um, things you'd like to say before we sign off today? Um, infectious diseases, newly emerging, re-emerging, uh, they are as much a socioeconomic problem as they are a medical problem. You're not going to be able to solve these uh, uh, problems just by medical improvement and medical technologies. Okay, So, uh, for example, the best research on tuberculosis is done in the advanced countries. Okay? But TB is still proliferating, you know, the, the, for decades. TB has been killing nearly one and a half million people a year. And even though a lot of the great research is coming out of the advanced countries, but on the ground, WHO has 2035 as a target. But if you look at the graph of the number of people dying every year, you don't see a big change. So understanding that socioeconomic conditions need to be improved to be able to have effective global public health solutions.